exploration of a central theme. This didn't seem to me like it, uh, you know, as I went along from one topic to the other, but looking back, I can see a coherent theme, and that is the fundamental change of worldview or change of paradigms, as it is often called, that is now occurring in science and in society. The unfolding of a new vision of reality and the social implications of this cultural transformation. The paradigm that is now receding has dominated our culture for over 300 years, during which it has shaped modern Western society and has significantly influenced other parts of the world. It consists of a number of deeply entrenched ideas and values. For example, the idea of the universe as a mechanical system composed of elementary building blocks. The view of the human body as a machine. The view of life in society as a competitive struggle for existence. The belief in unlimited material growth, material progress through economic and technological growth. All of these assumptions have been faithfully challenged by recent events and a radical revision of them is now occurring. During the last few decades, the mechanistic view of the world has begun to give way to a very different view, a holistic and ecological view. Instead of seeing the universe as a machine composed of elementary building blocks, scientists have discovered that the material world ultimately is a network of inseparable patterns of relationships. That the planet as a whole is a living, self-regulating system. The view of the human body as a machine and of the mind as a separate entity is being replaced by one that sees not only the brain, but also the immune system, the bodily, bodily tissues, and every single cell as a living, cognitive system. Evolution is no longer seen as a competitive struggle for existence, but rather as a cooperative dance in which creativity and the constant emergence of novelty are the driving forces. And with the new emphasis on complexity, networks, and patterns of organization, a whole new science of quality, of patterns, of shapes, is slowly emerging. Now, with this change of worldview, we can observe a fundamental change of the metaphors we use to express our understanding of reality. Whenever we talk about experience or about our view of the world, we use metaphors. This is one of the um, recent results of cognitive science, that human language is essentially metaphorical. For instance, when I say, this goes way over my head, it does, it's not really up there. Or when I say, I can't grasp this, I don't try to grasp it with my hand. It's, it's a metaphor. And so, for Descartes and Newton and the scientists of the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries, uh, the universe worked like a clock, and the clock became the guiding metaphor for the mechanistic paradigm. In the new ecological paradigm, by contrast, the central metaphor is the network. In modern science, the network perspective began in the 1920s in ecology, when ecological communities were seen as consisting of organisms linked together in food webs, which means in networks of feeding relations. And as this concept of the food web became more and more prominent in ecology, scientists began to use network models at other systems levels. 
and they began to view organisms as networks of cells and cells as networks of molecules, just as ecosystems are networks of individual organisms. So gradually it became evident that the network is a pattern that is common to all life. Now in recent years, as you well know, networks have become a major focus of attention, not only in science, but also in society and throughout a newly emerging global culture. Within a few years, the internet has become a powerful global network of communications. Most large corporations today are organized as decentral net decentralized networks of smaller uh, groups. And similar networks exist among non-profit and non-governmental organizations, the so-called NGOs. Indeed, networking has been one of the main activities of political grassroots organizations for years. Uh, those of you uh, who are my age will remember that we spoke about networking in the 1970s, long before the internet and uh, you know, similar network technologies. So the environmental movement, the human rights movement, the feminist movement, the peace movement, and many other political and cultural grassroots movements have organized themselves as networks networks that transcend national boundaries. And in ecology, the metaphor of the web of life has become very powerful. This is a metaphor that has been used by sages and poets throughout the ages. Today, the best known and most influential passage is in a poem written by Ted Perry and it was written in the early 1970s and it was inspired by a powerful speech delivered in 1854 by the famous uh, Native American leader, Chief Seattle, the leader of the Suquamish tribe of the Puget Sound Indians. The words of this poem are not taken literally from Chief Seattle's speech, although they come very close, and they reflect the spirit and ecological wisdom of the Native American leader. I'm sure many of you have heard this uh, poem before. Here it is. This we know. All things are connected like the blood which unites one family. Whatever befalls the earth befalls the sons and daughters of the earth. Man did not weave the web of life. He is merely a strand in it. Whatever he does to the web, he does to himself. Well, today we are painfully aware of the prophetic nature of Chief Seattle's words as we reflect on our global environmental crisis. We did not weave the web of life. We are merely a strand in it. Whatever we do to the web, we do to ourselves. The great success of our technologies and industrial systems as measured in economic and political terms, has caused tremendous damage to the global web of life. Today, the planet's ecological systems are on the verge of catastrophic, irreversible change. The most severe of the many interrelated human-made environmental problems is that of climate change. As Al Gore's film, An Inconvenient Truth, shows dramatically, Climate chaos is already visibly changing the planet. Melting polar ice sheets and alpine glaciers, threatening to inundate one third of the world's food producing land, and creating new weather patterns that lead to devastating hurricanes, epic droughts, and mass extinctions of plant and sea life. Fortunately, however, we are also witnessing a dramatic increase of ecological awareness. Combined with the rapid spread of projects and practices inspired by ecological or green design. We still have a window of opportunity to bridge the gap between human design 
and the ecologically sustainable systems of nature. To create the positive future we want, to build and nurture sustainable communities for us and for future generations. Among recent events, Al Gore's book and film have played a major role in raising ecological awareness. Gore's organization, The Climate Project, is now training 1,000 people in Nashville, Tennessee, a friend of mine who is from Slovenia, an environmental activist in Slovenia, just participated in this training. And uh, she told me that they are trained to deliver Al Gore's famous slideshow and uh, in this way spread the message worldwide. The other event that will have a major impact on public opinion, which you might not uh, know about, was the publication a couple of months ago of the most thorough economic analysis of climate change undertaken so far. This is a report that was commissioned by the British Treasury from an economist called Sir Nicholas Stern, who was um, a former chief economist of the World Bank, a very established uh, economist with a solid reputation. The report is known as the Stern Review and it turns the economic argument about global warming on its head. Whereas previously many politicians and corporate economists, including first and foremost those of the Bush administration, have insisted that curbing greenhouse gases emissions as stipulated by the Kyoto Protocol, would be, as they say, bad for the economy, the Stern Review says the exact opposite. It states emphatically that the world has to act now or face devastating economic consequences. Based on detailed ecological and economic modeling out to the end of this century, the report concludes that if we don't act now to halt global warming, we will be faced with an economic downturn of the kind that has not been seen since the Great Depression. On the other hand, the Stern Review estimates that stabilizing greenhouse gas emissions would be relatively cheap. It would cost no more than 1% of global GDP. If we don't do anything, the damage is about 20% of global GDP. So it's the exact opposite what, what the Bush economists and administration have been saying. I believe that as this message will be absorbed by politicians, economists and business leaders in the coming months, it is likely to change the debate on global climate change forever. If you want to read the full report or just a brief executive summary, just type Stern Review into Google and you get to the British Treasury website or HM Treasury as they like to call it, Her Majesty's Treasury, and you find a full documentation there. I believe that in the future, as this uh, information gets around, Nobody will be able to say anymore that fighting climate change will harm the economy and inaction will increasingly be recognized as irresponsible and immoral. Well, the question then is, the question then is, how can we change our individual patterns of behavior and consumption as well as our technologies and social institutions, so as to make them ecologically sustainable. It seems to me that a good starting point is the realization that we do not need to invent sustainable human communities from scratch, but can model them after nature's ecosystems. Because an ecosystem is a sustainable community. It is a community of plants, animals, and microorganisms, 
that has evolved over billions of years so as to maximize its long-term survival or sustainability. The outstanding characteristic of the biosphere is its inherent ability to sustain life. And therefore, a sustainable human community must be designed in such a way that its ways of life, technologies, and social institutions honor, support, and cooperate with nature's inherent ability to sustain life. This is the essence of the concept of ecological sustainability. It implies that the first step in our endeavor to build sustainable communities must be to become, as it were, ecologically literate. That is, we must understand the principles of organization that ecosystems have evolved to sustain the web of life. In the coming decades, the survival of humanity will depend on our ecological literacy, our ability to understand the basic principles of ecology and to live accordingly. And this means that ecological literacy or eco-literacy must become a critical skill for politicians, business leaders and professionals in all spheres and should be the most important part of education at all levels, from, from primary and secondary education on to college. We need to teach our children, our students, and our corporate and political leaders the fundamental facts of life. For example, that one species waste is another species food that matter cycles continually through the web of life, that the energy driving the ecological cycles flows from the sun, that diversity assures resilience, and that life from its beginning, more than three billion years ago, did not take over the planet by combat, but by networking. Just imagine if they learned that in the White House. Well, these are all basic principles of ecology, and they are all closely interrelated. They are just different aspects of a single fundamental pattern of organization that has enabled nature to sustain life for billions of years. In the last few years, I have tried to sort of put all this in a nutshell and sort of summarize this pattern of organization uh, with all these various principles that can be derived from it. And the best way I have found is to say that nature sustains life by creating and nurturing communities. And if you understand what a community is, then you understand all these other principles. We know that no individual organism can exist in isolation. Animals depend on the photosynthesis of plants for their energy needs. Plants depend on the carbon dioxide produced by animals, as well as on the nitrogen fixed by bacteria at their roots. And together, plants, animals, and microorganisms regulate the entire biosphere and maintain the conditions conducive to life. So we see that sustainability is not an individual property, but a property of an entire web of relationships. It always involves a whole community. This is the profound lesson we need to learn from nature. The way to sustain life is to build and nurture community. A sustainable human community interacts with other communities, human and non-human, in ways that enable them to live and develop according to their nature. Sustainability does not mean that things do not change. So sustainability doesn't mean sustaining the status quo. It is a dynamic process of co-evolution 
rather than a static state. And enhancing the dignity and sustainability of any one community will enhance all the others. Well, when you actually work in education and begin to teach these principles of ecology or principles of sustainability, you will soon find out that this is not all that easy. It requires a conceptual framework that is quite different from that of our conventional academic disciplines. And teachers notice that at all levels, from very small children to university students. Moreover, ecology is inherently multidisciplinary because ecosystems connect the living and the non-living world. Ecology, therefore, is grounded not only in biology, but also in geology, atmospheric chemistry, thermodynamics, and other branches of science. And when it comes to human ecology and human sustainability, we have to add a whole range of other fields, including agriculture, economics, industrial design, politics, and so on. So you cannot teach ecological literacy as a single isolated discipline. Well, over the past 10 years, my colleagues and I in Berkeley uh, have developed uh, a special pedagogy that teaches uh, this kind of knowledge in public schools. Our organization is called Center for Ecoliteracy and you find it on the web under ecoliteracy.org. <laughs> and we call our pedagogy Education for Sustainable Living. It offers an experiential, participatory, and multidisciplinary approach to ecological literacy. When we teach this in our schools, it is important to us that the students not only understand ecology, but also experience it in nature, in a school garden, on a beach, in a riverbed, and so on. And that they also experience community while they become ecologically literate. Otherwise, you could imagine a situation where we could train first-rate theoretical ecologists who then don't care about nature or the world, don't feel any responsibility, and just go on to do other things. So in our ecoliteracy schools, we want to create experiences that lead to an emotional relationship with the natural world. And community is essential for that. It is essential for understanding sustainability, and also for teaching ecology in this multidisciplinary way. In schools, various disciplines need to be integrated to create an ecological focus, an ecologically oriented curriculum. And obviously, this is not possible if the math teacher does not talk to the geography teacher, who does not talk to the social science teacher. So only if there's a community among the teachers, the parents, the administrators, uh, can we have this integrated school curriculum. <clears throat> In other words, the conceptual relationships among the various disciplines can be made explicit only if there are corresponding human relationships among the teachers and administrators. Ten years of work have convinced us that education for sustainable living can be best practiced if the whole school is transformed into a learning community. In such a learning community, teachers, students, administrators and parents are all interlinked in a network of relationships working together to facilitate learning. Well, let me come back to the content of the teaching 
the basic principles of ecology. To really understand these principles requires a new way of seeing the world and a new way of thinking. Because ecology is first and foremost a science of relationships. Relationships among the members of ecosystem communities. And therefore, to understand the principles of ecology, we need to think in terms of relationships and context. In science, this type of thinking is known as systems thinking or systemic thinking. It is characteristic of the theory of living systems, which is only now fully emerging, but which has its roots in several fields of science that were developed during the first half of the 20th century. Fields like organismic biology, general systems theory, and cybernetics. In one of my books, The Web of Life, the same as the title of this talk, I spend three chapters in the book on giving the whole history of systems thinking, cybernetics and general systems theory, and so on. In all these fields, scientists explored living systems, which means integrated wholes whose properties cannot be reduced to those of smaller parts. Although we can distinguish parts in any living system, the nature of the whole is always different from the mere sum of its parts. Because you also have to take into account the relationships and the processes that are involved. So systems thinking means thinking in terms of relationships, patterns, context, and processes. <clears throat> During the past 20 years, this type of thinking was raised to a new level with the development of complexity theory, which is a new mathematical language, a new set of concepts to describe the complexity of living systems. In the Web of Life, I also have a whole chapter on the basic concepts of complexity theory. And I have used these concepts to develop a unified view of life, mind, and society, which I presented in my last book, which is called The Hidden Connections. And in that book, I extend the systems approach from biology to the social and cultural domain and apply it to some of the major issues of our time. Well, one of the most important insights of this new systemic understanding of life is the recognition that I mentioned at the beginning of my talk that networks are the basic pattern of organization of all living systems. Ecosystems are understood in terms of food webs, that is, networks of organisms, organisms as networks of cells, cells as networks of molecules, and so on. The network is a pattern that is common to all life. Wherever we see life, we see networks. However, it is important to realize that these living networks are not material structures, like a fishing net or a spider web. You cannot go out into a forest and take a picture of the web of life. It's not a material structure. It's a pattern of relationships. When you study the various feeding relations of the animals and plants and microorganisms, and when you do diagrams and things, uh, you will see that they form a network pattern. We call these functional networks, networks that interlink various processes. In a cell, for example, these processes are chemical reactions. The molecules in a cell are engaged in a large number of chemical processes that are all interlinked uh, in this network fashion. Now, over the last 25 years, these 
living networks have been studied uh, quite extensively. And these studies have shown that there is a key characteristic that they have all in common, and that is that they are self-generating. In a cell, for example, which is the simplest living organism, in a cell, all the biological structures, the proteins, the DNA, the cell membranes, and so on, all the large-scale biological structures are continually produced, repaired, and regenerated by the cellular network. Similarly, at the level of a multicellular organism, the bodily cells are continually regenerated and recycled by the organism's metabolic network. So living networks continually create or recreate themselves by transforming or replacing their components. And in this way, they undergo continual structural change while preserving their web-like patterns of organization. Now, one of the exciting features of this systems approach is that you can apply this kind of thinking and these concepts also to the social domain. Life in the social realm can also be understood in terms of networks, <clears throat> but here we're not talking about chemical reactions, we're talking about communications. Living networks in human society are networks of communications. <clears throat> and like biological networks, they are self-generating. But what they generate is mostly non-material. Each communication creates thoughts, information, meaning, which then give rise to further communications. And so the entire network generates itself. Now, I have found that the dimension of meaning is crucial to understand social networks. I've come across quite a few systems theorists, uh, management consultants and others who would do what they call network studies or network analysis and they would go into an organization, for instance, and then draw diagrams about which person talks to which other person, and how often do they talk to each other, and are there feedback loops, and what's the network pattern, and they draw beautiful diagrams, but they never ask the question, what do these people talk about? And that's, of course, essential to understand a human social system. If you don't understand the meaning of the communications, you don't understand the network. It's as if you were to understand a cellular network without knowing biochemistry. Then you don't understand the processes of the cell. And so in a human social network, if you don't understand the meaning of the conversation, you won't understand the network. And therefore we need the social sciences, philosophy, political science, anthropology, and so on, to really understand these human networks. And even when uh, human networks produce material structures, as we do, everything material you see here, our whole infrastructure, our technologies, uh, the products we sell in our businesses, all those are produced by human networks, but they are produced for a certain purpose, according to a certain design, and they incorporate cultural meaning. For example, this, this glass was designed to hold water so you can use it to drink water, but it also incorporates a cultural meaning because in different cultures, if you go to Bali, for instance, they will serve water or coconut uh, juice in a very different kind of container. Or if you, you know, if you go to Australian Aborigines, to take extreme examples, the glasses they use, if they are glasses, you know, will have very different shapes because they incorporate 
cultural traditions, just as this lecture hall incorporates a certain cultural tradition, certain history, and so on. So the, the non-material cultural aspect, the meaning is always embodied in whatever we produce in human networks. Now, in, in my book, The Hidden Connections, I explore this similarity and the differences between biological and social networks to a great extent, and I find this a, a very fascinating topic. To summarize, you can say that biological networks operate in the realm of matter and social networks operate in the realm of meaning. Both produce material structures and in addition, social networks also produce the non-material characteristics of culture, namely values, rules of behavior, shared knowledge, and so on. So, I go into this analysis and then I apply this framework to some of the critical problems of our time. So let me now return to one of the most important critical issues, uh, how to create communities, technologies, and social uh, institutions that are ecologically sustainable. As I've emphasized, ecological literacy or eco-literacy is the first step on the road to sustainability. And the second step is eco-design. We need to apply our ecological knowledge to the fundamental redesign of our technologies and social institutions so as to make them ecologically sustainable. Now, from the ecological perspective, design can be understood as the shaping of flows of energy and matter for human purposes. This is a definition I've taken from the uh, eco-designer and ecologist David Orr, who teaches at Oberlin College in Ohio. He defines design as the shaping of flows of energy and matter for human purposes. Ecological design is a process in which our human purposes are carefully meshed with the larger patterns and flows in the natural world. Ecological design principles reflect the principles of organization that nature has evolved to sustain the web of life. To practice design in such a context requires a fundamental shift in our attitude toward nature. Instead of finding out what we can extract from nature, we have to find out what we can learn from her. And that's a very different attitude. Now, in recent years, and that's the good news, there has been a dramatic rise in ecologically oriented design practices and pro projects, all of which are now well documented. In the last chapter of The Hidden Connections, I have a fairly long section about these eco-design practices with uh, literature, websites, uh, names of organizations, and so on. Let me just give you a few examples. The worldwide renaissance in organic farming can be seen as a practice of ecological design because organic farmers use ecological principles to increase their yields, to fight pests, and so on. There's, there are also um, projects in which different industries are organized into ecological clusters in such a way that the waste of one industry is taken up by the next as a resource, just as in an ecosystem the waste of one species is food for the next. There's an organization called ZERI, Z-E-R-I, which stands for Zero Emissions Research Initiatives that practices that industrial clustering. Eco-designers speak of a shift from a product-oriented economy 
to what they call a service and flow economy, in which raw materials and technical components cycle continually between manufacturer and uh, user. So that, for instance, when you, when you buy a television, um, you don't want to buy a box of toxic chemicals. That's not why you buy a TV. You want to watch TV, that's why you buy it. So it makes much more sense to buy the service. So you lease the television, <clears throat> the ownership remains with the manufacturer who has the obligation to take it back at the end of its life cycle or when you want a new one and then deconstruct it and recycle the components and so on so that the components cycle through the system. Well, there's a lot of eco-design in the energy sector, as you well know. Uh, hybrid electric cars, for instance, achieving <coughs> fuel efficiencies of 50 miles per gallon and more. And finally, the development of efficient hydrogen fuel cells which herald a whole new type of economy, sometimes called the hydrogen economy. So we are at the beginning of a historic transition from the fossil fuel age to uh, alternatives. It is absolutely feasible already with technologies available today to completely sever our dependence on foreign oil. In fact, Now, listen to this. If we increased the average fuel efficiency of our cars by a mere three miles per gallon, we would not need to import any Persian Gulf oil. Just imagine how that would change our whole foreign policy. Now, three miles per gallon technologically is easy. My Toyota Prius, which is as I call it, a vintage Prius, a 2002 Prius, uh, it gets between 40 and 45 miles per gallon easily. And the new ones are, are even better. So three miles per gallon increase on the average is nothing. And it would completely change you know, the, we, the way we see foreign policy. In fact, with existing technologies and a smart strategy, we could even satisfy all our energy needs without any oil. This is a plan put forth by Amory Lovins, the founder of the Rocky Mountain Institute. He and his colleagues published, recently published a book called Winning the Oil Endgame. And again, um, executive summaries are available on their website, Rocky Mountain Institute. The website is RMI for Rocky Mountain Institute, rmi.org. And they provide a roadmap for going beyond oil in 20 years without any additional costs. In fact, this strategy for ending our oil dependence would actually save $70 billion in those 20 years. Now, strategies like the one outlined by the Rocky Mountain Institute would not only save, solve our energy problems, but also several other problems. And this is characteristic for any kind of systemic solution. Um, solutions based on systems thinking, or to use a popular phrase, solutions that connect the dots. This is critical today, not only in science and technology, but also in politics and civic life, as most of our political and show a striking inability to connect the dots, as we have seen again and again. Let me just mention one more example. If we served organically grown food in our schools, we would not have the current epidemic of obesity among our children. We would not poison our farm workers and the increased carbon content of the organic soil would draw down significant amounts of CO2 
and contribute to fighting global warming. So these are all solutions to different problems if you have a systemic approach. So the eco-design technology projects I have just briefly mentioned are all based on this type of systemic thinking. They all incorporate the basic principles of ecology and therefore have some key characteristics in common. They tend to be small-scale projects with plenty of diversity, energy efficient, non-polluting, community oriented and labor intensive, creating plenty of jobs. The technologies available now provide compelling evidence that the transition to a sustainable future is no longer a technical or a conceptual problem. It's a problem of values and of political will. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. <clears throat> I believe we have uh, time for questions, and those of you who are regulars know the system. There are microphones somewhere out there in the dark. If we could have more light in the house, please, so that I could see people when they speak. OK, there's a microphone here on your left and another one here on your right. OK, sir. Thank you very much for an interesting... Maybe if we just wait one minute till the people sure. who want to leave, leave. You're supposed to say that, Terry. <clears throat> Ter Terry gets too angry when he says that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, thank you for an interesting presentation. And I certainly agree with the importance of taking our time and choosing an appropriate metaphor which in turn has a lot of social implications. And you're proposing ecology as the metaphor for understanding our lives because it's sustained the web of life, as you say, for, for a right. long time. But I suggest that a careful look at ecology reveals that it's inherently unstable, profoundly so, and ecology has resulted in the extinction of well over 99% of the species that have ever existed. And my question is the, rel the value of choosing ecology then as a metaphor. If the point of ecology is simply to remind us about the importance of cooperation, everyone agrees. We need to cooperate in order to survive. Beyond that, ecology is a, a non-mindful existential game and it plays dirty and it's a dangerous metaphor I would suggest for our social future. Well, a very loaded question. Thank I you. The question part. And uh, I think, you know, the ecology has many meanings. There's ecology as science, there's ecology as technology, as politics, as philosophy, as a spiritual orientation. It covers a, a whole range. If you, if you start with sustainability, and if you notice that nature has sustained life, has not sustained individual species for billions of years. Some, yes, but most of them disappear. But it has sustained life. And let's, let's pause for a moment and really re reflect on what I mean by that. As you know, organisms multiply and, and procreate by cell division, all living Organisms consist of cells, and cells divide. That's how new cells are created. And life has been sustained from the first living cell through this endless process of cell division. Not every individual cell remains. Of course, cells are die, die and are reborn. But this network process that began in the first cell is still going on in our cells today. Now certainly we can learn something from nature about sustainability, and we can learn from ecosystems about sustainability. 
what you call this learning, whether you call it ecological literacy or systemic thinking or network thinking or ecology, you know, is then a semantic question. But what I claim is that we can learn from the wisdom of nature. Thank you for a great yeah. presentation. Over there, please. Yes, it's my turn. <clears throat> so, uh, sustainable energy forms like uh, wind and solar are very uh, real estate intensive, very demanding for land, and they seem to be in conflict with uh, food needing that same resource. I know you, you say networking is sort of yeah. the way that things work together. Is there, yeah. I guess my question would be, is there some way where we could pattern uh, the sustainable energy development to be more in, in tune with uh, use, sharing the same land with uh, food resources? Wind yeah. sort of does that, but it still really takes yeah. up precious resources. Well, I think uh, the the main error, the main flaw that I always see when, when the media talk about sustainable energy and what is the solution is that they are single-minded and they analyze one solution. And there is no one solution. That's part of systemic thinking, that you don't say it's all windmills or it's all biofuel. I mean, if, if it's all biofuel, then we don't have enough land. We can't eat. That's, that's what you're saying. Let me just outline the, the Amory Lovins plan to go beyond oil. You know, very basically what he says is, we can save half the oil we use by making our cars super light. See, our cars are very heavy, and there are now technologies that use uh, special plastics embedded with carbon fibers. This is the... the uh, uh, the bodies they use in Formula One racing, uh, those of you who have followed Formula One racing may have noticed that in the last 20 years there have been fewer and fewer accidents. A lot of famous race car drivers used to get killed in races. They don't anymore. They have huge crashes and they walk away from the crashes because these bodies are elastic and super strong and they are super light. Now, if we build our cars with these materials, we save half of the oil. Another 25% of the oil, Lovin says, can be replaced by biofuels. And the remaining 25% by a number of technologies, wind and hydropower and so on. So you have to, you have, to have a combination of technologies and energy sources, and it has to be appropriate for the climate, for the region, for the cultural tradition, and so on. It's not easy. Nobody says ecology is easy or eco-design is easy. But at the same time, because it's diverse, it requires a lot of changing things around, building a little thing here, connecting a little thing to another thing over there, and all this is very labor-intensive. So it engages the community, it creates jobs. Okay, next over here. Friedhoff, uh, yeah. my name is Milt Markowitz, Hi. and uh, my question has to do with uh, a comment you made about uh, connecting the uh, emotion of your students right. uh, with ecology. Right. And um, I assume that your own uh, connection has increased as you've done this work over the years, that you've had pretty profound changes. Huh. And my questions are, um, uh, has your reverence and appreciation for life changed as you've gone through this process? And the second question, how important to achieving sustainability is it that cultures be motivated um, by our increased love of life? <laughs> well, what I have discovered in, in my own experience is that I have reconnected very strongly with my childhood. You see, I grew up on a farm in Austria. I spent the first 10 years of my life, you know, running barefoot for three months in a year in the summer and, you know, knowing two dozen uh, species of apples and pears and cherries and knowing all the little critters in the earth and so on. I had a real connection with the land. And uh, this was a uh, not very large farmhouse uh, in Austria uh, where we had a horse and 
three cows and vegetable production and uh, a business of selling flowers. And uh, this was in the early 40s, just uh, during and then after the war, where we had to be completely uh, self-sufficient because you couldn't buy anything. But on the farm, we produced everything. So I remember from my childhood that you know we baked bread and we, we made butter and we pressed sunflower seeds for oil and all, all that stuff. And this memory is extremely vivid uh, in me. I could sit down with you and draw you a fairly exact map of that farm and I could tell you where the potato field was, where the strawberries were, where the chamomile bush was, you know, where the hay was, where the goat shed was, and so on. And I say was because this farm doesn't exist anymore. But it, is, it still exists in my head and in that of my brother and my cousins. So it's a very strong connection with the land and with ecology, as I would say now, that I made as a child. And so I know if you reconnect children with food, with the land, with gardens, with creeks, then you create a very strong emotional connection. Thank you. Okay. Thank you again, yeah. Mr. Capra. Yeah. Um, you mentioned a TV's life cycle, and, uh, and you also mentioned the inconvenient truth. Yeah. And I just wanted to offer, first off, just um, a quick thought that um, a multimedia presentation with your talk would be phenomenal for the young at heart and the young mm -hmm. in the audience as well. What are your thoughts on green nanotech and, uh, or safer nanotechnology, mm. so, as it's so-called? Well, this is where I show my ignorance. Uh, I, uh, for years, I've wanted to really find somebody who could teach me things about nanotechnology, and uh, I, I haven't pursued it. Not that I haven't found anybody, I haven't searched hard enough, and, and I really don't have any views on it. And I'm also slightly embarrassed by your question about the slideshow because I agree it would be great, but you know, I'm of a generation who is not very good with PowerPoint and multimedia and all that stuff. And uh, you know, my daughter can do that, but she's off in Santa Cruz studying theater and you know, she doesn't want to, to do a slideshow for her dad. But um, I guess I should promise you that next time I come here, I will come with a slideshow. I will just you know, ask some young people to do it for me. Yeah. Thank you. You mentioned. Uh, oh, up, upstairs we have a microphone also. I didn't know. So. Okay, go ahead. Uh, first of all, thank you, Doctor, for coming to Portland. And so um, you briefly mentioned this ideal school for ecology. Right. What, would you think that's a very plausible idea? And if that's something we might see in the future? Absolutely, not in the future, but they exist already. We have, the Center for Ecoliteracy has a whole network of, I don't know, 40, 50 and more schools. So there are more than 100 schools now, all over Northern California. And I know that there are similar schools in Oregon. So if you go to our website, ecoliteracy.org, you will find a list of the schools and you will find information about it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, let's you back. mentioned uh, cybernetics in, your, in right. your talk, and last night on OPB there was a, um, a debate on 20, 22nd century technology, cyborgs, mm -hmm. um, and it's the ultimate network. We're all connected. Yeah. Uh, Studying the physical sciences and the social sciences, so that's, yeah. that's really important, yeah. so thank you for Great. that. That gives me hope. Um, I also, I mean, because my students are always, you know, we talk about this and they say this seems so obvious. Why are we not making these, yeah. taking these actions and solving social problems? Um, so my question is that I am involved with um, a discussion group through the Northwest Earth Institute on sustainable living. And one of the core questions they ask is, do we have hope or fear for the future? And you're giving me hope but I also have a sense of fear in terms of the urgency in achieving these goals. Yes. And I was wondering if you, what you suggest is needed to encourage our leaders, our industries, et cetera, to create the structural change we need that's going along with this paradigm yeah. shift. Well, I, I think it's a very important question. And if I had come 
a year earlier, if I had come at the same time last year, I wouldn't have had a, a really good answer for you. But I think things in this last year have changed quite dramatically. With not only with Al Gore's book and film and slideshow, but also this stern review. I'm really very excited about that. And I think to publicize this, I think would be the best you can do. And regarding hope and fear, this is, uh, you know, a, an emotional dilemma and an existential dilemma that, that I have too. And uh, one of the sort of uh, uh, ad advices that, that I'm heeding is uh, a phrase from uh, an Italian political theorist, uh, uh, Antonio Gramsci. And Gramsci wrote that we need the pessimism of the intellect, but the optimism of the will. And so I, I try. See, we need, we need to recognize the danger, but we can't just be paralyzed by fear because we are activists. And so we need the optimism of the will. Thank, Thank you for the question. Let's Thank go up to the gentleman. Yeah. Will the needs of humankind for things other than sustainability sabotage or counteract the productivity? If so, how does an ecological approach deal with those needs? Well, I, th I think, uh, of course, sustainability is not the only human need, but it is sort of the boundary condition or is the context we have to put all our needs and desires and aspirations into this context of sustainability. <laughs> and if somebody says, you know, my business is more important than sustainability, then you can say, well, if we don't manage to sustain ourselves, you won't have a business. And I, I say this to physicists. I say there won't be any physics in 20 years if, if we don't manage to be sustainable. And, and there won't be any telecommunication, and there won't be any this or that, whatever people are in, in whatever profession they're in. So it has to be a boundary condition or a context. Yes, over there. You spoke about organic farming and the principles that go along yes. with, with that. But we've seen a lot of things coming now, like with Walmart entering the organic farming business, and we've seen that they have uh, pressed organic farmers to cut their prices. Therefore, the people who are working on the organic farms are not, who are Walmart who is buying, are not able to make uh, a sustainable living. Yeah. And also, when, they're, when Walmart is looking for organic farms, they are not going within the 50 mile radius of the <clears throat> store but they are looking at maybe organic farming, say, from China or from Argentina. Yeah. And yeah. how can we develop a sense of understanding that just because something says organic, that it's not necessarily uh, good. It is good in a healthful sense, yeah. but we need to speak of organic and, and those kinds of things in terms that really mean something that when they are be co being co-opted in uh, a product producing um, country. Right, I'm, I'm very glad you make this comment. I mean, this whole uh, discussion of agriculture, I mentioned this just in two sentences, it, it needs a much more elaborate discussion. And in, in my book, I, I spend much more space on it. Uh, not everything that is organic is sustainable. That's essentially what you're saying. A very nice way of putting it is that of the slow food movement in Italy. I don't know whether you heard of that. That's a movement that began a few years ago. And uh, they are emphasizing traditional food. And they say slow food has to be good, by which they mean traditionally cooked, slowly, slowly eaten, the culture of eating. Good, clean, by which they mean organically grown, no toxics, and so on, and just. Good, clean, and just. And uh, the original is buono, pulito, e giusto. That's how they say it. Good, clean, and just. And that sort of summarizes the sustainable component. Okay. Is there anyone up top? 
No, okay. Uh, I've been known for asking. Oh, sorry, there is, there is somebody now, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Take it up. Go ahead. Hi, um, I just want to play devil's advocate and um, okay. ask you, uh, the networking and sustainability you talk about from ecology, um, these are emergent properties of systems. Mm -hmm. That is, they don't arise as a result of planning on the part of the individuals involved. It's the result of each individual trying to do its best with the resources that are available. So applying this property to social systems, one could just as easily deduce that capitalism, war, and competition are the way toward diversity and sustainability um, as self-directed networking and cooperation in society. So how and why do you decide that the latter is a more apt analogy than the former? Yeah, good. Very good question. Um, I think th what you're pointing to is the difference between an ecosystem and human communities. There are principles of ecology that the two have in common or should have in common, but in an ecosystem, there is no culture, there is no thought, there is no democracy, there is no justice, there is also no lying and cheating, no exploitation, and so on and so forth. So that's the difference. Our human attributes qualities and shortfalls of, of consciousness and culture are the difference. And we have the ability to recognize that we're doing harm and to change things. So we can do it by planning. It doesn't, it doesn't have to just emerge. We can have a combination between emergence and planning. Again, that would necessitate a very long discussion, which would be an interesting discussion. Thank you. Yes. My question is similar to that, but oh. it's a little bit sh straightforward. How well do you think... Now, where are you? I'm right here, on the, your left. Oh, oh right, yeah. okay. Yeah. How, um, <laughs> how well do you think uh, complexity theorists understand evolutionary processes, and um, <clears throat> what role do you see exploring the laws of complexity have with sustainability, and further, like, what advice would you give to mathematicians and mathematical modelers who are sustainability and sustainable development folks as well and would like to see complexity theory pushed a little bit more vibrantly into sustainable development. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think that's, that's not only an important field, but it's also a very exciting field. And as you say, it hasn't got very far. Right. In biology, complexity theorists have made some very interesting discover, uh, discoveries about evolution. What they have discovered is that the neo-Darwinian model of mutation, random mutation followed by natural selection, is only a small part of the story. There are essentially three avenues of evolution. One is mutation, as in the neo-Darwinian model. The other one is the exchange of genes among bacteria, gene trading, which occurs on a daily basis, all bacteria constantly exchange genes. It's a very effective way <coughs> of altering the genome and evolving. And the third one is the acquisition of entire genomes by larger organisms ingesting bacteria. It's also a process known as symbiogenesis, um, creation of new species and new forms by symbiosis. And in all these three cases, mutation, gene training, trading, and symbiosis, the new genome incorporates some changes or incorporates entire smaller genomes, and that process of incorporating novelty into the existing genome is a very complex process. And complexity theory has helped a lot of understanding the dynamics of that process. And it shows that although there is a random element in evolution, that random element is relatively small. Most of evolution <coughs> is a highly organized, ordered process. And I think that's, that's a big difference in, in perception. Okay. Oh, first, I want to thank you for doing this important work and coming here to Portland. Yeah. Uh, I want to kind of hark back to what the woman was saying where she was caught between hope and fear. Mm. Uh, 
I, th I hear what you're saying about culture, and here's an example. Today I went to get an espresso coffee, and I stopped in a store that was run by a man from Bosnia, and he was so proud of the beans that came from Bosnia. And I said, oh, is Bosnia growing coffee? Oh, no, 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 these beans were grown in Brazil. And they were shipped to Bosnia and roasted there, and then they came back to me in Portland, Oregon. Yeah, yeah. And I just didn't have the heart to burst yeah. his bubble. His face was shining yeah. with pride, yeah. you know, to point out uh, how inefficient this was. How do, we, how do we educate the general public? I hear that you're educating children, yeah. but I agree with the sense of urgency. Yeah. In the networking, are we bringing in... Uh, people who write TV shows? I mean, what, how are we going to educate the general public? Well, you, you just have to pursue any, any avenue you can. And in this case, I think you have to point out to people that we are very close to uh, what they call peak oil. The, the oil resources, resources are either peaking right now or have already peaked. So from now on, there will be less and less oil, and therefore the oil will be more and more expensive. So very soon, your Bosnian friend will not be able to afford shipping beans from Brazil to Bosnia and then to Portland. It will just be too expensive. So energy costs will rise, which will be a good thing, because if energy is produ produced locally with alternative sources, solar, biomass, and so on, you don't have to, you know, ship things around, and if you grow food locally, same thing. So there's this whole shift from, from the global to the local that is very important. Can My question relates to what you closed with about values and political will and what you just said. I think we all agree that the necessity of that shift um, but our governments disagree with that, and as energy gets more expensive, they seem willing to invade more countries and kill more people to get cheaper oil. Do you see any way of getting around a government that is so hostile to the eco-philosophy that we're talking about here tonight? Yeah, well, again, you know, things recently have, have shifted a little bit. And, you know, now um, we have the uh, environmental committee in the Senate led by Barbara Boxer, which is a different story from what it was uh, half a year ago. And we have uh, both houses of Congress controlled by the Democrats, who essentially don't have much of a clue of what to do. You know? So in this political activism can be really effective because Two years from now, there's another election. And if they get a strong message from us that those are the things we are paying attention to and we will hold them responsible, they will listen. I think now is one of these times where you really have leverage in, in you know, writing to your representatives. And I think that's what we should do. Thank you. Okay, let, let's have... One more from each microphone, and then, and then we have to close. Okay. Um, you've, you've mentioned that the inconvenient truth arguments have recently come into the discussion and also the Stern Review. But another thing that's happened in the last several months is a number of scientists, particularly atmospheric scientists, and some of them of very high stature, I believe one of them is a Nobel Prize winner, have begun discussing seriously intervening in the climate on a global scale, doing things like putting sulfate into the upper atmosphere in order to mitigate global warming problems, which they see may become so overwhelming in the near future that things like this will need to be considered. And I'm just kind of curious to see how you react to ideas like this, and are these ideas that you can also put into your ecological approach or model that you seem to favor that you know, we should take? Yeah, or, are, I, or are these things, things that you consider to be just really uh, irresponsible? Yeah, I, don't, I haven't uh, studied this. I have sort of heard rumors, but I have not really read anything about it in detail. Uh, but I think it's a good example of uh, what uh, designers call end of the pipe technologies. You know, first we create the pollution and then we create a technical fix to, to, to fix it. Uh, Amory Lovins says, uh, when they talk about filters, 
you know, to, to, um, uh, to put into our, you know, water systems and, and various agricultural installations, they come up with all kinds of uh, filters to filter out the toxic components. Lovin says the most important filters have to be placed in the heads of the designers. So, you know, it's the, at the beginning of design. And, and if we change our habits of agriculture, transportation, uh, you know, consumerism and so on, which, which can be easily done, then we don't need these, you know, very, very complicated high-tech solutions at the end of the pipe. Up in the... Now, you've said that your interest really lies in the fundamental paradigm shifts of right. humans. Um, some of the uh, solutions that you posed were really much, I saw that they were kind of based really in the paradigm that we're stuck in right now. That is, watching television, driving cars, and like you just said, having um, the filters in the, in the minds of the designers is really important. Yeah. I'm wondering about having the filters sort of before the minds of the designers. What kind of fundamental paradigm shifts are necessary for our world really to become sustainable? What kind of fundamental paradigm shifts beyond what you've talked about now do you see as really important in, in reaching a sustainable future? Yeah, well, it, it all depends. I think it, it all depends on, on how far uh, you want to go. Uh, a friend of mine estimated uh, what environmental impact we have in our day-to-day -day lifestyles and estimated which actions have the greatest environmental impact, negative environmental impact, okay? So he came up with the three top contenders. The first one is having children. Sounds funny, but the more children you have, the more you multiply the effects, right? The second one is driving cars. And the third one is eating meat, which has a huge environmental impact. So I tell people that if they do two out of the three, and I can put myself as an example because I have one daughter and I drive a Prius and I don't eat meat. So if you do two of the three, you know, we'll be better off. But it's, again, an individual choice of how far you want to go. Yes, and the last question over there. Well, that, that might tie a little bit to, I was curious of your, your comments about the importance of diversity, which in my mind begins to associate with tolerance, although I don't know if the way you meant it, that's actually true. But I'm curious for you to say a little more about diversity and possibly the idea of more tolerance, if that's relevant. Yeah. Well. Diversity, again, is important at all systems levels. I, I spoke about it in terms of ecology. In an ecological network, in a food web, or any other kind of ecological network, certain species have certain functions. If one species is eliminated by changing environmental conditions or catastrophes or something, the network will still function well if there's another species with slightly similar roles. And the more different species there are, the more complex the network is, the tighter the network is, the more stable it will be. And that translates into biodiversity. <clears throat> In the human re realm, this translates into cultural diversity and intellectual diversity. The more solutions we can find, the more different ways we can come up with to think about a specific problem, the more solutions we will find, the more uh, resilient we will be. And this translates into cultural diversity. And uh, of course, cultural diversity is valid only if it's combined with tolerance and interconnectedness. Well, thank you all very much for the discussion.
Strata Prius, they're available, but people don't buy it. So how do you get... No, 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 it's not true that people don't buy Prius. It's that no, if, no. if you want to buy one, you have to wait for six months. Yeah. But they're extremely popular. But why do people buy the, hum the Hummers and people and things like that? Well... Well, you know, Arnold has four of them. <laughs> it's, you know, it's a question of values and, you know, it's cultural, yeah. yeah. Well, I think, I mean, the cafe standards is the average. And people buy what, whatever is on the market. And if the average is higher by law, you know, well, just well, uh, pass it all at con in Congress. It's easy. You did it in the 70s. But how does that influence buyer's choice? But they can choose whatever they want, but the average will be higher because the car manufacturers will manufacture different cars, and they're forced to do so. So, so are you... Fifth child? Yeah. You know, there, there are other ways of doing it. For instance, uh, in my Prius, I, uh, I drive in the carpool lanes, even when I'm driving alone, because, because that's the law in California. If you have a hybrid, you can use the carpool lane. So, you know, that's a big incentive. I don't commute usually because I work at home, but uh, you know if I want to drive somewhere like like yesterday, uh, this morning actually I drove to the airport. There was a lot of traffic. I drove in the couple then. So. How does passing law to regulate the behavior change behavior? Like how does it change behavior and work within the ecological model? Where, you know your yeah, the, the, the four point plan. yeah. How does passing law work within the ecological model? I think I think what you have to do is to you know I think the the um, the role of government is to create the conditions for society to live well, and so if you pass laws where carbon is taxed, for instance, you know a green tax on carbon. Then, and if you do it cleverly, so that the carbon tax will increase by 1% or 2% every year and you have a long-term projection, then the industry will change and everybody will change and competition will be automatically competition for a better environment because it's built into the infrastructure. And so, you know, that's what government has to do and what government can do. But yeah, of course, top down command and control, but yeah. influential things like taxes and incentives. Yeah. Well, it's it's again, you know, the the political process, the pressure of of, of the voters, and but you have the pressure of the voters, and then you have the corporations on the other side. So it's it's not an easy enterprise. Bill yeah. Moyers had a program on a, a number of weeks ago about his God Green. Um, it's it, it was a program entitled Is God Green? Uh -huh. And it amazed me about how the people who were evangelical had to have the permission of their minister mm -hmm. in order to go green. Yeah. Although one guy who was interviewed said, you know, I always really felt like in my heart I should be doing ecological stuff, mm -hmm. but until my minister said it was okay, uh, I couldn't really do it. Did, did so they say? Did they say that she is green or he is green? <laughs> 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 Definitely. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, but uh, <laughs> the, I mean, how do you deal with with people who really need to be led, either by a minister or by? But but it's so funny, you know, if you if you are a religious person, a truly religious person, then you know that. Anything we say about God would be so far below what God really is, you know, and would be so so inappropriate uh, or insufficient that all these things about he and she and God green sort of is ridiculous, you know. 
But they vote. Yeah, yeah, they yeah, they of vote. course, of course they do, yeah. yeah. Yes. There's a lot of talk about um, changing our words in order to save ourselves. And then there is an argument about, you know, it's too late, and then there is an argument for, um, we can change course and save ourselves, but it has to be now, for example. What is your... What is your well, I, th I think, I don't think it's too late. I think we still have, I don't know, 10 years maybe, something like that. It's getting there. So, you know, we really, we really do have to act. But, you know, change can happen very fast. We just talked about it before. Imagine, um, remember the Soviet Union uh, around 1985? And it was a seemingly monolithic communist bloc with an enormous power, you know, dominating half of the world. And, and six years later, it was gone. You know, things can change. It was hollow. It was, of course, not what it seemed at the time. It was already hollowed out. So, you know, who knows? You know, General Motors may be as hollow now as, as the, uh, what, what was it called? The... Um, um, the head of the Soviet Union, what was the, the, the office called? The Kremlin? No, the, the, yeah, the, the Kremlin, but the, uh, I mean the top of the, the Politburo, right? The Politburo was completely hollowed out. and you know? the Republican Party? Yeah, maybe, yeah. Maybe, who knows? You know? Yeah, who knows? Yes? Are you familiar with the term green scare? No, I know green washing, but not green. How about uh, Earth Liberation Front, Animal li Liberation Front? Oh, yeah. Animal Liberation Front, I knew, and I know Earth First, maybe that's what you're referring to. These groups are a bit more radical than Earth First, but yeah. um, I want to ask you an inflammatory question, mm. pun intended. <laughs> um, you talked about optimism of the will. Mm. Uh, perhaps triumph of the will would be another way of saying it. I want to ask you what's your, what's your acceptable um, definition of tactics as far as exercising will is concerned, because the Earth Liberation Front and the Animal, Animal Liberation Front both use what this society cons considers extreme tactics. And it's, it's relevant as far as time is concerned because these groups think that we're running out of time yeah. and that we've already yeah. done the write your letters and call your congressman stuff and they're using much more extreme tactics. What's, what's your opinion about exercising your will? I, th I think extreme tactics are good if they're non-violent. You know, Gandhi no, used extreme... No one has extreme been killed in any of these tactics. Hmm? No one has been killed in any of these yeah, tactics. I, I think they're talking about property destruction. The rules well, not both, it's okay. I don't, I don't know. Uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not a political organizer. I'm an educator and I'm an intellectual. So I'm not, this is not a field where I feel comfortable and, and you know, where I have expertise. But I, yeah, but just sort of intuit, sort of uh, emotionally at a personal level, I abhor violence and, you know, I grew up, uh, I was born in 1939, and so the whole Nazi regime and the whole fascism is very something very visceral for me. And, and you know, ever since that time, I've abhorred violence and of any kind, and so I, I would not condone any of that. But otherwise, I, I so really you're saying that property destruction is violence in, in your mind? Yeah, it could be. Yeah. Yeah. Don't blow up a coal fire power plant tomorrow. No. Yeah. What sort of things um, would you recommend that, I mean, we're kind of a select group here, what would we do, I mean, besides educate our students and be active in the party of, that leans towards green? Well, I would say I'm, I'm really very enthusiastic about this report that came out in England in, at the end of October, the Stern Review. I think to, to promote that and publicize that, because uh, about two weeks ago, uh, there was an interview with 
somebody with Barbara Boxer on NPR, and she was asked about the new environmental committee in the Senate and about global warning, warming. And she was pussyfooting around the issue, and she didn't mention the Stern Review, you know? And I was absolutely flabbergasted, because I thought she had done her homework and, you know, would, would know. And, and she was asked, yeah, but isn't it bad for the economy, you know? She should have said, no, on the contrary, it's good for the economy, and we have the data, you know? But she didn't. So I think to publicize this uh, is very important. Right, our congressman? Yeah, yeah. I heard that same interview, and I was yeah. taken by her statement um, that, on the one hand, you know, there were certain certain efforts that needed to take place, mm -hmm. but that there would be people giving a certain amount of pushback. Yeah, yeah. That there would be yeah. compromise. Yeah, yeah, like, oh, exactly. Yeah. yeah. What you were you compromise? brushing your teeth at the same time as I was? I was was in the morning. Yeah, I was. <laughs> You're making me cough. Yeah. yeah. No, it was it yeah. was terrible. Yeah. Yeah. Richard Leakey was here a few years ago, and uh, some kids had pulled together fifty dollars. They pooled it together, and he asked, "What could we do with our fifty dollars to help?" Yeah. And he said, uh, "Influence public opinion, yeah. uh, because public opinion is the thing that uh, can make the changes." Like yeah, that that's of course very general for kids. Yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah. But well, he gave me some specific. Oh, yeah, he did. Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah. I'd sort of like to follow up on what you said, John. I, what I remember was what the EU did that made a tremendous difference to the ivory trade. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Basically, I remember it did two things. There was a huge cast of ivory that could have been used in various ways, paid for all sorts of programs, could have been used for forensic yeah. scientists. And he torched it. Only a leader could have got away with that, even in Kenya. And he did it, and then he also had slogans. So in the vehicles, every time he was photographed, saying only the elephants should wear ivory. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And what he did with the power of a leaky name and his own personal stature would make it very uncool to want ivory. And I think that PR yeah. yeah. will did a tremendous amount to take the bottom out of the yeah. 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 Ye
one year Prius, when you really do the math on the Priuses, they don't make a lot of economic sense. Oh, they don't? They do not. And I'm just How come? It would make sense if gasoline prices were higher. So my question really is, how does one in this country make gasoline more expensive? Yeah, well, it's good. But still, you know, what what are the gas prices now? Three dollars or something? Two fifty? That's cheap. Two fifty-five. Yeah, but but I pay. I tell people, you know, I pay, you know, under one fifty for the gallon of gas because statistically, I use half the gas of everything else of everybody else. No, less for the car. No. I pay I pay twenty thousand dollars for my Prius and the service is free. I pay much less than you pay for your car. No, no, no. No, that's the Detroit propaganda. It, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I'm not Detroit, and I've run the numbers. Can we get obnoxious at this point? No, but I, I agree with you. It should it should be much more expensive. In Europe, it's much more expensive. How would the government make it palatable to pass such a tax? Well, you know, raise the cafe standards, the 50 cent tax that they were talking about. You know. You think 50 cents would do it? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's uh, this is getting into too much detail for me because that's not my expertise. How to get things through the legal process and so on. The uh, the uh, man who came to uh, to uh, to the state two uh, times a uh, Bartol Bartol Bartol. Anyway, the lion the lion guy. The lion guy, right? Turn it. The journal, right. Eternal. It was San Bartolo. Bartolo. San Bartolo was really uh, good. One of the parts of the talk, it was a very small part of the, uh, the, of the talk, but it was that uh, how the Mayan civilization fell. Yeah. And the ecological nightmare that they developed over time, how you could trace in the record itself how the resources became very thin and they used just you know, how much they, they put up the goop on their their homes and that went from being very thick because there was much of it, lots of spend, lots of burn, so it was just a very thin. Yeah. They have their, their, their ability to sustain things continue to fall. Now there are many of those, I mean some of those we're still trying to try to dig to figure out, but there's been many uh, civilizations. Uh, yeah, there's a famous example of the, I think it's called the Eastern Islands or something. Eastern Islands, yeah. So my point is, I mean, that's one of the things that we're trying to get to, because there's a lot of something about 15 minutes ago and you remind me again I mean you guys here are a community and you get a lot of interesting people here who, who speak who tell you about a lot of things who have projects and so on what if you had a Portland website with a sexy title sort of interesting things we have heard you know but but you know something that catches people's imagination and I think you could popularize these things and really spread them. There's, do you know this website Common Dreams? Yep. And I, I look at it almost every day and it's, it's really very good. Some, something like that, which, which has Portland in it and you know things that have come to our mind and, and it's clear that it's an ecological perspective, something, you have to cook up something 
nice, you know, and a good nice. design, and I think it would be great, you know. Comment. There's a <coughs> there's a group with a very sexy name called the Salilo Group. Mm -hmm. They've got the Salilo Indian, Salilo Falls, and it's headed by a guy named Nick Blosser who used to work for me until he got bored and decided he had to go out and do his own thing. He said. And I describe Nick as a guy who is doing things. He didn't wait around for a piece of legislation to start creating the, uh, the new economy. And they've done stuff like the Food Alliance, where they, they go out and they get all the restaurants locally to coordinate with the farmers who are doing sustainable farming practices. Yeah. So they agree to buy preferentially from the, the restaurants by preferentially yeah. from those farmers. And they've got a green building program going. And they've got energy programs going. They've got all sorts mm. of stuff. And the point of this is, there's a huge opportunity to do things. And this is a question of action. Yeah. And Nick is an example of just saying, I mean, he's got some connections. He gets yeah. the public PG, he gives him money and different people. But he's just out doing a huge amount of stuff. He had 400 people down at the, this two years ago, he's doing it every year now. He's now Seattle, well, he's in the mm -hmm. Bay Area now. Nice, so. right. Yeah. And he's got he had like 400 business leaders together mm -hmm. sitting around trying to figure out what is the new economy. They're all well motivated. They're all trying to figure out where to go. And it's going to happen. Yeah. I think like what Schwarzenegger is doing in California. Yeah. Saying, but hey, I mean, you, have, do you have connections, worldwide connections to science and philosophy through these programs. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you just go through the records of the last five years, and just publish things on the in some format that is easy to read, you know, no, nothing too heavy, nothing too long, but something easy to read. You know, interesting things to consider, or something we have heard, you know, all things considered, whatever, some, some nice title, it's you know. Words, what I'm saying, though, is what, what the, the laboratories of democracy kind of concept. So I'm saying what yeah. Oregon can do in California, is, in some sense, following, we're following California, and maybe California follows some of what we do. We can have, we can make our own cafe standards. You don't have to wait yeah. around for the Congress yeah. to do that. Sure. You yeah. can do that stuff, and California yeah. has the clout. If California does that... Well, you, you have done some things like this in Oregon yeah, yeah, already, yeah. right? Some of them like got Like a, a voting system, I yeah, remember, yeah. some time ago. Yeah. 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 Bottle bill. Yeah. 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 Bottle bill. Yeah. Bottle bill. Looking at actually having uh, <laughs> yeah. medical coverage. <laughs> so, first of all, to my knowledge, we actually, they do not have the right to make the California an exception. They have this special legislation in California because of the size, it's important to have a federal environmental standard. Right, all, the, all the other 49 states cannot take the same leadership role as far as I know. Well, that's just cloud. That's because they have the cloud. Uh, well, we no, can I, think there, I think there's, there's some weird exception that was created in a particular law. And they created, they carved out an exception for California, if I remember correctly. And it came up the last time that these CAFE standards came up. Uh, but I wanted to, you know, say something else. My frustration is I find no access point. I think things like the food alliance, there's a great effort. Salmon Nation, wonderful effort. Uh, the Oregon, you know, renewable energy programs and the um, energy trust, those are all great, wonderful things. But they are dropped in the ocean. And um, there's a, um, and this drives me nuts about America to a certain extent, and it drives me nuts about Portland in particular, there's this superstition that small is beautiful. And I'm definitely a fan of the notion that you should do everything at the lowest possible level. Yeah. I just think that this is not something that can be done at a particularly low level. In fact, I think even the United States level is a little bit low. It's the highest we can go, but it's a little bit low given the magnitude of the problem. And writing to a congressman is just it's kind of an exercise in frustration. For me, I'm not a citizen for one, but, but what does that really do? Now, I see businesses, this is the yeah, high-tech industry, the oil industry, they can get together, they can actually write legislation and take a thing to a congressman and say, sponsor it. And they talk over lunch and they say, what do we need to change so you can sponsor this? And then this guy works in a coalition, gets five other Congress people to sponsor it with him, and they make it into legislation. Why is it that the city of Portland and the Sierra Club and activists, that we cannot get together and write legislation, go to someone and say, sponsor this. Sponsor a renewable energy law, like, you know, many of them are popping up in Europe right now. What, what is stopping us? What is, is, are there any efforts like this underway that you're aware of? I don't know. Can I kick in a little bit? Yes. Uh, one thing I say is there's just been a change in the wind uh, as in the last election. And one of the things that's changed in that election for Oregon is that 
you've had a lot of guys in there for a while. Our people have been in there a long time. Ron Wyden and Smith and David Wu and these people. And all of a sudden, these people who were completely on the out because of political structure are now in very powerful positions. Ron Wyden is pushing nationally the voting by mail thing, which is huge, I think, potentially, with the effect of that. Second thing, he's actually standing up and saying, you know, every other industrialized nation in the world has universal health care. What the hell are we doing? Yeah, right, right. Okay. And, and they don't have the death penalty. <laughs> <laughs> That's another characteristic. Yeah. But, but, but Wyden, I mean, talking about who's doing what, so Wyden, David Wu, who's a friend of mine, actually stood up in the middle of all this stuff and really kicked ass on the Iraq war. I mean, before a lot of other people did. And he's not in a, a powerful position, but a lot of these guys are, and a lot of these, uh, um, financially, they're, they're in positions that are going to have tremendous impact and control on financial. So if there was a moment when you wanted to write to your legislator mm -hmm. or to your representative in Oregon, this is the moment. These guys need to hear that you're behind them, need to hear the yeah. program. I think so to, uh, yeah. hear, Thanks a lot yeah. for standing up and kicking butt. And yeah, I do think universal health care, let me hear about that and follow what Biden's doing and see that. These guys are in very powerful positions, they can do stuff. And they're really stepping up and saying we're going to try. And so I think there's uh, a lot of hope. That well, look at look at Hillary Clinton. Suddenly she's against the war, you know. Yeah. I mean, yeah. just. Yeah. Yeah, but he really. Yeah. <laughs> well, we say Schwarzenegger's going to become a Democrat. In <laughs> so how do you get along with Arnie? Do you ever met him? No. no. You're from the same country, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm the better skier. <laughs> you have this resonance connection. Yeah. Yeah, I think we can close this now, yeah? <laughs> okay, thanks very much. It was fun. Infrastructure. I have. I spend a lot of time. I spend a lot of money paying people who do things for me. So you don't write the monthly payment on your paper. You don't write the checks. So. Uh, I don't write. I sign the checks, but I don't write them. No. No. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No. I have a. You know. I have a, an assistant and a bookkeeper, and you know. That is, that is. You should write a book. And I have, uh, I have, no, I have, I'm a very orderly person and in my research I'm very organized. And uh, so also over, I don't know, many years I built up when I became well known as an author and got a lot of mail and you know, a lot of people wanted to contact me I built up screens around me so that people can't reach me. And, and now this is much less necessary because people don't write letters anymore. They only use email. And I tell everybody I don't have email, so I don't know, so my mail just dropped. Okay. Thank you.